Thank you so much for being here. Please enjoy your meal. Please go back for a second. My name is Onita Maestas. I'm the director of our Cultural Awareness and Student Achievement Center, or AKA our CASA Center, um, on the other side of the library on 101 Faculty Drive. And this is our Cesar Chavez Week. <laughs> Thank you so much to Carol and Nielsen Library for the collaborative work that she's doing with CASA to make these events happen this week. Uh, many of these events are grant funded and we, we're really appreciative of the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area. We're really appreciative of the uh, Unidos grant and library and CASA funding to make all of this happen for you today. I need everyone to give a big round of applause to Sodexo because they work with us to put on this meal for you today. So thank you. And if you haven't tried the dessert this year, uh, chefs specifically ordered, the, they're called Zangos. It's a chimichanga with cream cheese in it. So you have to get a Zango on the dessert table. They're to die for. Kindred spirits, thank you so much for allowing us to partake and, and be a part of the, of the kindred spirits speaking during this special week for us. And I'd really like to uh, allow our guest speaker to to spend more time with you. So this is Senor Lawrence Trujillo. He was born and raised in Center, Colorado. And at the age of 12, he started working in the fields because that's the age you, you had to be before working in the fields. And you worked the lettuce fields, right, Mr. Trujillo? So he started working in the lettuce fields. In 1971, they went on strike in Center, Colorado. And he's going to tell you his story about when Cesar Chavez actually came to Center, Colorado to help them through the huelga, or through the strike. So without further ado, can you please help me in welcoming Senor Trujillo. Hello, my name is Lawrence. Uh, I'm talking to you today about uh, a little bit about family, uh, about growing up in Center, and uh, a little bit about inspiration. Mm -hmm inspiration I had growing up. Uh, now my, my dad and my mother and seven months in Cedar Trujillo, we we're not well off financially, but they had what we called the poor man's wealth. We had a lot of kids and they had a good work ethic. And that's what they instilled in our kids. In the kids. Uh, I started working probably when I was about eight years old, seven, eight years old, and my dad had some trucks and he would uh, haul hay here in the valley. So what we'd do is, I'm eight years old, and he would set me up in the driver's seat of the truck in the field, start it up, put it in the compound, and we then I'd steer between the rolls of the bales, and I'd be standing on the seat. And when they needed that truck to stop, I just reach over and shut the switch off because I couldn't reach the pedals. So that was my job. And uh, then they would get in the truck and turn it around. These would be my uh, older cousins or, or my older brothers later on. And for this job, my dad would pay me a dollar a day. And being eight years old, a dollar a day is just real good in the, in the early 60s. So, uh, anyway, we grew up uh, doing this hauling hay, uh, doing summer jobs. Another thing that they used to do is they used to uh, kind of farm our kids out. So, uh, they would have uh, uh, a couple of weeks where we would pick peas. And they would load us up in, in back of pickup trucks or uh, pick us up in a bus and take us out to the fields. And we'd all pick uh, peas. and. Uh, sweet peas and put them into a bushel and we'd get paid a penny a pound. Now if you're real hard working and stay with it, you could probably make two dollars a day. And that was pretty good. You're 10, 11 years old and, and pretty good wages for, for our families because they let all the kids get out and they didn't have to take care of them or something. Some uh, you graduate from that move on, 
get older, you can do more work. So then we would go out and uh, we'd start doing uh, uh, hauling bales, hauling hay. For this job, you uh, at that point I would have my younger sisters driving the trucks, and I would be hauling the bales up onto the flatbed truck, and take that, take those bales, take them down to the farmhouse where we were at, and then you stack them up there. For this job, you'd get paid a penny a bale. So this was real hard work out in the sun, uh, you know, and just all the time we're, we're working hard, and, and it's all about family. Because you're working with your brothers, you're working with your cousins, everybody's working. Through this whole time, the thing that my parents stressed the most was our education. Because yeah, you had to work through the summer months, you had to learn what hard work was, but you had to have an education. So they made us, they, they stressed that as we're growing up, when school starts, summer jobs are over, you're going to school, and as hard as you work in the fields, that's as hard as you work in, in the classroom. And everybody wants, you had to have everybody graduate, that, that was the main point. Uh, at, when you get a little bit older, you, you start working in the lettuce fields. This is, uh, I think I started in 69, right around there, late 60s, 68, 69. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen the lettuce fields. Um, they're usually about the length of, of, of the uh, lot that they're on is a mile on the lot. And then they're cut in half by usually an irrigation ditch at that time. So that's what they used to irrigate them. Uh, so, we're talking about a lettuce field that's uh, about half a mile long. And if you've seen lettuce grow up, you got a bunch of plants coming up in the road. And then what you can do is they take this tool here, which is called the parador, and everybody has this. Now, you can imagine what we're doing here is you take the you start on one end of the field and you bend over and you start hacking. And you want a length of, of, of your hoe to hit and you don't want to leave a double. So you've got to be sitting here and you do this and then you do this and you go until you reach the end of the field. Because if you stop someplace in between and get up, and there's pain in your back from being stooped over. Then you gotta get back down, but you gotta finish that roll. Now, what we would do is we, if you were good, you'd get down to the end of the row, and if you're first to get to the end of the row, you go help the other people, people that are behind you. The ones that didn't go as fast. Because as soon as you get down, everybody gets down to the end of the row, then you get five minutes to rest. And that's when you stand up, stretch your back, get a drink of water. The other thing that we have to realize when we're doing this work is that there were no bathrooms out there. So we had uh, uh, ladies that were working in the field, young girls. They had to take a part and go out someplace and form a wall. There was no, no facilities at all. The only water we had out there is we brought our own. And for this great work, we had uh, we had a payment of, but uh, we had a minimum wage at that time was two dollars. They had a thing that was uh, called uh, agricultural deferment. What that meant was the farmers, the growers, didn't have to pay the minimum wage, so they paid you half the minimum wage, which was a dollar an hour. So right this time, uh, everybody's working hard. We have all our families out there. Uh, if you have six kids, as soon as they get to be 12 years old, we put them in the lettuce fields. And they're getting a dollar an hour. And the people that are running the crew, I don't know how much they're getting, but uh, they're getting some money that they got all their kids in there. And that's all helping the family. And that's what we that's the way we grew up. So we were strong. 
we were united with that, with that work. Right about this time, uh, we started hearing some words in the, in the field. And what they were telling us was, you know, we should at least be getting paid minimum wage for doing the stoop labor. We should at least be getting $2 an hour. We started hearing words like, stand up. Viva la raza. Huelga. These are words that we were hearing. Brown power. Right about this time, Viva la, la causa. So, through this time, everybody said, yeah, let's, let's start, let's strike. We didn't have any organizers before. We didn't know what to do. We called to, uh, we called some, some places that were talking about uh, the UFW, farm workers. And they had some people in Denver <laughs> That uh, organizers that came down and talked to us and said, "Yeah, you guys are, are doing stoop labor, and they're taking advantage of you. You guys need to stand up for your rights." So we went out. Everybody walked out of the fields, and we were united. All our families. Everybody said, "Let's go out." Then we started hearing some different words because. Some people didn't want to walk out. Some of our families were saying, no, you guys are lazy. Those are the words we're doing. Mantenidos, you want the government to take care of you. You guys are just, you don't want to work. If you wanted to work, you'd be out here with us. And now we have families against families. Cousins, brothers, uh, your uncles. Uh, these, these are people that we were uh, really strong with. And these are the ones that were calling us. So we called them names back. You guys are scabs. You strike for you. You guys are turncoats. Stand with us. Come on out. Help us. We'll all come together. We'll all uh, benefit from this. <coughs> But when you got a family working, and this is the only money that they're going to earn through the years, I don't think that they, they, they saw the end result. All they saw was they were not going to do without a paycheck for this week. And that's what they were standing in for. Uh, at that time, we had, uh, we had a lot of dissension. We had a lot of uh, uh, animosity. Uh, there were uh, police force who were wanting to stay in the middle uh, or stay you know, out of the fray. They wanted to stay neutral. But these were our uncles. My dad was in the police force. Uh, we were on strike. We were doing demonstrations. We were walking the picket line. Uh, my, uh, one of my uncles was a sheriff of Swatch County. He had to maintain the peace. He had, to, uh, he had people uh, telling him to arrest us, to, to not let us demonstrate. He had to stay neutral. We had, uh, he was, people were calling him names. We were calling the strike for their names. One of my aunts. Uh, we had uh, De Herreras. We had uh, Trujillos. We had uh, De Vargas. Uh, there was a couple of Trujillos. Uh, these are just strong, strong family. But now we're all fighting against each other. They had uh, uh, vandalism. And it, it, I, I can't stress how, how hard it was for, I, I know my dad would come home and he would, he would uh, really stress that here we are on strike, he has to go arrest his, his uh, nephews, he has to arrest his, uh, his own, his, uh, our uncles, our cousins. And uh, going, going through this, uh, the families were what was really important. Now, uh, our organizers, uh, uh, we had uh, We 
had Ben Ben Avila. That's the name I was trying to remember. Ben Avila was our was main uh, organizer, and uh, so right around 1971. Uh, Everybody was getting a little bit discouraged. We've been uh, probably about two years without work. Uh, some of the older people trying to to raise family now, now instead of getting a dollar an hour, they weren't getting anything. Uh, everybody's starting to get a little bit discouraged. We, uh, we would have speakers come in all the time, uh, and that's that's about the time that uh, we started hearing that Cesar Chavez was going to come and talk to us. Now, in the early 70s, not a lot of people knew who Cesar Chavez was. Uh, we knew about the rape strike in, uh, in California, but we didn't really know who, what that cause was. All we knew about was our lettuce strike. So Cesar Chavez came in and uh, everybody was really excited. I didn't know who he was, but he started talking about. Uh, now, uh, uh, Cesar Chavez was not a fiery speaker. He didn't get up there and rant and rave. What he did was he talked calm, talked common sense. He talked about family. He talked about the causa, what we were fighting for. We were fighting for better working conditions. We were fighting for more higher wages for our student labor. Uh, the one thing that I got out of hearing him talk was, you know, when this strike is over, when we've won our, our cause, we have to go back and live with our families. All these people that we're arguing with, that we're calling names, these are our cousins, these are still our families. These are the people that you have to go back to. And that's what we did. And I remember after that talk, uh, one of my friends said, this is a great man. Just in hearing him talk, I didn't know who he was, but he could tell that his message was, and was family, was education, and sticking together. So that was a great man. That was my inspiration growing up. Uh, right now, I'd like to read a poem about, uh, written by uh, Joaquin Zafetenieto, and it's called, uh, it's called uh, Cesar Chavez Speaks During His 25-Day Hunger Strike. And these are what his thoughts of what Cesar Chavez might say if he was able to address the media every day. Day one. I ate well last night, so my, you must know I began this fight with the belly filled with frijoles and fire, with the heart full of hope and desire, that this will all end peacefully. So I begin, my sergeant, not forlorn, but filled with the knowledge that our destiny is greater than your ignorance. I need look no further than the back of my hand to remind myself that we will no longer be seen as immigrants in our own land. Day three. I hunger only for freedom. I desire not food, but equality in our fields, our schools, our barrios, our camps, our towns and cities, our homes, our leaders, our country. We thirst not for water, we simply thirst for justice. And remember, brothers and sisters, before we find it in them, let us first find it in us. Day seven. Are you listening, America? It has been one week since I've tasted food. Can you tell me, what did the grapes in the, on the table taste like? Sacrifice? Pesticide? Hopelessness? Blood, sweat, <coughs> tears, or do they taste like fear? The fear that you will have to work the fields that we do. Day 10. 
Can you hear us, America, in the voices of your white children? If you wonder why so many of them have beautiful brown accents, it's because you pay us meagerly, despite the work that we do, we work for you. To clean your home and raise your children as if they were our own. Day 13. We may be simple field workers, but we are far from simple-minded. We see you not watching us waste away. Day 14. I have not yet begun to fight. Day 17. We seek only what's right, not violence, only peace, only a peace of what every American wants and deserves. The dream lives in us as it lives in you. Day 20. There are things out there that cannot be foreclosed upon, that cannot be taken from us. What we want, what we demand, justice, compassion, peace, safe working conditions, fair wages, the chance for a better tomorrow, and the day after that. These are not requests, these are rights, and they are unnamed. Day 22. Young people, I ask you, what will you do when your time here is done? What will they say of you? I challenge you, implore you, entreat you to do more, to be more than you ever dreamed possible. Your skin is brown like the earth we work, but you are so much more than the color of your skin. You are the dreams of those who came before you. Sus padres, sus abuelos, y sus padres antes que ellos. Never forget their sacrifice, how they toiled under the sun so that you and your son would not have to. Day 24. A beautiful viejito once said, just because I speak with an accent, do not think for one second that means I dream with one too. But more than this needs to be said, I ask you. Day 25. Let this not be the end. Let it begin with a whisper, with one voice speaking to another, with paper and pen, with your hand on the shoulder of your sister, your brother, your father, your mother, with a shout, with a chant, with a cry, with a poem. Sing it to your children as you hold them. Let it start with me, with you, with us. All that is right is within our reach, within our grasp. Let us practice what we teach. Let this be more than just a dream. Dreams don't fill the bellies of hungry children while our hearts soar while our hearts are in the clouds, our heads are in the clouds, let us look down to our feet, planted firmly in the reality of soil beneath. Let us praise the bountiful earth. Let us rejoice in our beautiful hands, which is the color of the dirt we work. Knowing that we only have the fortitude, knowing that only we have the fortitude, the strength to do so, let us shout from rooftops. The power of our voice will lead them in choice. So say it now, say it loud, say it proud. Let the stand we make be the thunderstorm that wakes them. Let our accents rain down on them, shake them to their core until they shout no more. But even then we will continue until our voices strain. Hundreds of voices, thousands of voices, millions of voices shouting to the world what we have known in the hearts to be true all along. Dile conmigo, mi gente. Say it with me, my people. Si se puede. Si se puede. Si se puede. Thank you.